Well, good morning. Good to see you here. Hey, we had 99 in the first service. Yeah, we had, uh, had a large number from 180. Uh, they were here last week, too, visiting with us, but they had a good crowd first service. I'd like to welcome you who are here, you who are online, you who may be in the parking lot, and it's good to see everyone here. Good to see Marty back with us there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she gave me a little note to read. She says, I want to thank you all for the prayers, phone calls, uh, cards during my illness. I miss everyone and hope to be able to come back to worship services soon. I feel every prayer and appreciate you all in God's love, Marty. Well, Amen. you guys are back. We're glad you're here. So, uh, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Also, uh, on a sadder note, I uh, got a text from Charlotte Barnes. Her, her boyfriend uh, passed away this morning. And... Uh, yeah, I got a text that they were, uh, he was in the hospital doing CPR and then just learned he passed away. So be praying for Charlotte. Uh, it's a, that's a, a very tough time for her. And so be praying for her this morning. As far as uh, other announcements I want to remind you of, uh, just keep remembering the uh, shoebox, uh, Operation Christmas Child. We're collecting year-round, you know, so, and so bring your stuff as you can. Uh, sign up for dinner theater. Uh, I said in the first service that it's in March. Actually, it's in May. Uh, so, uh, you guys knew that, though, didn't you? So, uh, since this is April, but uh, next year. Yeah, but anyway, sign up for the dinner theater, okay? And uh, don't forget to do that. Members meeting is Wednesday night, uh, and Kingdom Men meet tomorrow night. Uh, don't forget that. And just make note of all the stuff that's going on, uh, you know, at, at our schedule and everything. And uh, we're just glad everybody's here today, and Brother Doc's going to come, and uh, He's our, our senior deacon, our, probably our senior member here, and, uh, and I said in the first service he was even on the ark, but I can't confirm that, but uh, can't deny it or not, but anyway, Brother Doc, would you? As we come, we want to remember Sherry. Barnes and her loss. And then, Father, we want to ask you to have mercy upon all those that are being persecuted. And we would like to change the situation in our nation in which so many people hate the Christian. They hate God. Father, help us to live in such a manner that people will desire to know you. Help us to be that neighbor that we're supposed to be. Use us to compel them to come because you have said, go ye into all the world and make disciples. Father, we're not moving in the right direction strong enough. We need your help. Help us to bend our knees and to use our thoughts to bring your kingdom. We know you love us. You live in us. You take care of us. We ask, Lord, that more of our neighbors and our friends and our families come to you. Help us to be that evangelistic outreach that will help them to understand that there is a better way. So we just pray that those around us who do not know you, will see you in us, change us in such a manner. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. Pick us up and start us over again. Father, I'm without words. I just know that I've leaned on you. Help me to compel others to come to you. 
Now we ask you to bless those that are faithful here, those that do our song leading, and those that proclaim the gospel, our pastors. We just ask your blessings upon them. Help them to encourage us and help us, Father, to listen. Take away the hardness of our hearts. Take away the judgmental effect of our mind. Help us to love as you have told us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We pray that we'll be of use to others in coming to know you as their leader and Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us Jesus Christ. As we think of the things that we would be into if it wasn't for him. Thank you. You have directed our lives. You have used us to build your kingdom here on earth. We continue to pray that we'll reach out and that we'll do what you've asked for us to do. Help us to share your word, share the things of this life in the church. We're so grateful that we have a building, we have a group of people that come faithfully and worship. And again, for the persecuted Christians. I read where it said, go ahead, there will be some more that will die. And their souls were under the altar. And then they will rise up and praise the Lord in the right time. Lord, I just offer myself to be used to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. For everything there is a, reason, a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to, time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. There's a time for everything. There's a lot of good and bad that happens in our lives. And we know that because we have Christ in our heart, we know that we can lean in his arms and that, in all, and that victory is in his and that all is well. So let's stand and let's sing to that this morning.
Father, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with all of our souls because we have Christ in our hearts. Father, we thank you for that gracious act that you did upon the cross. And three days later, you rose him from the grave and improved everything everything right and righteous. And Lord, we just ask that anybody here that doesn't know the truth, that today will be the day that their eyes will be open to it. Father, we thank you for the good and the bad times in our life in which we have to lean on you and we know that if we do that, all is well with our soul. Father, we just thank you for this time and Lord, we just thank you for the message that's about to be presented before us. For in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. We'll turn your Bibles to Judges, Judges chapter 8 as we continue in the book of Judges and studying this passage this week, I've come up with just one thought. This chapter is about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, the good and bad and the ugly of living in a fallen world. And uh, there was a movie out about that several years ago. We could play the theme song to it before I begin, but we won't do that. But uh, this morning we're in chapter 8, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but several verses of the chapter. So let's all stand. You can follow on the screen, or I will let you know where we're at as we go. We begin with the first verse, and we're taking up from last week. Remember Gideon and his army, the torches, blew the trumpet, stood on the hillside, and the Midianites thought they were being attacked by maybe 300 divisions of men, not 300 men. It was dark. They started swinging their swords and hearing them clang, and they assumed they were the Israelites when actually it was their own people. They were killing each other, and so the Lord uh, killed 120,000 of them. Uh, they killed 120,000 themselves, and so the army that's on the hillside, the 300 now, sends out a a decree or all over the country, let's uh, chase them down, uh, cut them off at the Jordan River. And now Gideon and his 300 men are on their way pursuing uh, what's left of the army, just 15,000. 300 against 15,000, that's kind of, you know, interesting too. But anyway, that's where we take off. And this is what happens in verse 1. Then the men of Ephraim said to him, that's Gideon, What is this you have done to us not to call us when you went to fight against Midian? And they accused him fiercely. Verse 4. And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. He and the 300 men who were with him exhausted yet pursuing. Verse 10. Now Ziba and Zamina were in Kador, Kakor with the army, about 15,000 men, all who were left of the army of the people of the east. For there had fallen 120,000 men who drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of the tent dwellers east of Nobeth, and Jogabah, and attacked the army, for the army felt secure. Verse 15. And he came to the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Ziba and Zamina, about whom you taught me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zamina already in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are exhausted? And he took the elders of the city, and he took thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them taught the men of Succoth a lesson. And he broke down the tower of Phinehal, and killed the men of the city. Verse 21. Then Ziba and Zamina said, Rise yourself and fall on us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon rose and killed Ziba and Zamina, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Verse 23. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, for my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in the city of Ophrah. And all the Israel whored after it. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the uh, people of Israel. And they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest forty years in the days of Gideon. Verse 32. And Gideon the son of Joash died in a good old age. And was buried in the tomb of Joash's father. At Ophrah of the Abizrites. As soon as Gideon died. The people of Israel turned again. And whored after Baal. And made Baal bear their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God. Who had delivered them from the hand of their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel. That is Gideon. In return for all the good that he had done. To Israel. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word that's truth. It doesn't gloss over things. 
It gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly of things. Help us to learn from this today that we may not repeat the errors of the past. We recognize the good of your hand and, Lord, that we do not uh, reject your grace. There's some here who don't know you. Open their hearts to hear today and believe. And those who do, give us food and give us insights on which to live. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in this fallen world that we're in. And if you look around, it is getting, it's good, but it's getting bad and ugly out there. Israel lived in a tumult time, and Scripture teaches us that in the last days, difficult times will come, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders without self-control, brutal without love for what is good. Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the former religion but denying its power. Avoid these people, the Bible says. If we look at our society, we see our character dropping. We see in these last days men are becoming more degenerate in their activities and character. We see in the book of Judges, Israel living in perilous times, and their times was due to their rebellion against God, and God, because of that, judged them by allowing the Mennonites to overrun their land with 135,000 camels, men on camels, and they would steal their crops. They would force the Israelis to hide in the caves. They would kill them, probably rape them, uh, steal their food, and it was God's judgment. But in the book of Judges, we also see how God raised up imperfect people, judges, to deliver his, the people of his covenant and it was all for God's, by God's grace for God's glory. Last week we saw how God used an imperfect man named Gideon to call him and use him to defeat the Midianites. And today we witness God continually to advance his redemptive purpose through Gideon and his mission. And we see the results of this advancement of God's purpose. Uh, there's the good, there's the bad, there's the ugly. And in our text today, we're going to see three ways we should respond to God, God as He continues His redemptive work in the world, of which the responses will be good, bad, and ugly. The first thing we see is the good is this. In a fallen world, God is at work with His redemption plan. You know, God could have, as soon as man sinned, could have slain him, sent him to hell. But God so loved the world that He chose to save people of the world. And so therefore, history is about God's redemptive plan. That's the good of what's going on. Is there any other good? No, that's the only thing that really matters. What do you think? That's the good that's going on. And so we as people need to look, lift up our eyes and look how God has accomplished the good purpose of His will through past events and imperfect people. Yeah, the Titanic is sinking, right? But the good is there's people... Down in the bottom, keeping the lights on so those who will can get to a lifeboat. That's good. And so we see in the world, we see things happening, but the good that's going on is God is using people to save some. He could let everybody perish, but He's going to save some. And we see Gideon is one of those imperfect people that God is using to advance His cause in spite of all the horrendous things that's happening. You look at World War II and you say that was bad, but you know, there is good that came out of World War II. You know, people tried to kill Hitler. And maybe that was good they tried to do that. But you notice they failed. You'd think that God would bless them for trying to kill Hitler. What do you all think? But maybe God had a bigger plan in mind. To allow Hitler to exist for a little while longer. Because after World War II, Israel became a sovereign nation again. Okay, a lot of it had to do with the realigning of the world after World War II. That was the big picture. So God was even working good with the bad and ugly that took place in World War II. It's much bigger than you think. And I've said this before, we as Americans think we're privileged because we're something special. Okay, well, no, God just has a plan or had, had a plan for us. Uh, Battle, Battle of Midway, you've heard me say this before, the difference in victory and defeat was the clouds opened up 
so that our spotter plane found their carriers before their spotter plane found our carriers. And that turned the tide of the war. You say, why? Because God believes in we're special? No. I think God preserved us to protect his people Israel, which we've had been a friend for years. See, it's not about us. It's about God's redemptive plan. And everything that's going on, though it, it looks bad, you know, God, that's why the Bible says all things work together for good. For everybody, no. For those who are the called according to his purpose. For who, you don't like this word, for who he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. So all these things that are happening is happening for good for the believer, okay, for God's people. I can't say that for everybody else. But God is at work. And, and Gideon, how did God work good in Gideon and advance his cause? Well, first of all, he, he used Gideon to be a peacemaker of truth. No sooner than the battle was going on, we find that uh, uh, the, uh, the Ephraimites... Uh, came to Gideon and they said, what you have done to us? You haven't called us to fight against Midian. And they accused Gideon. And isn't that something? Once things good are going, uh, there is a protest from your own side. You know, you'd think everybody would be happy. Man, the Gideon or the Midianites are on the run, but the Ephraimites, they, they came and they said, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you consult us? You know, why are you, are you a one-man show, Gideon? Uh, why are you getting all the glory? That happens in church sometimes. Why didn't we do it this way? Why didn't you talk to us about it? When something great is going on. I remember one church uh, I preached years ago. I was young. And, and during that revival, during that week we had 10 baptisms. Okay, it was a great revival. The church had held about 100. We averaged 110 every night. I mean, people, were, when you walked in the back door, there was a bench on the back door. You remember those old churches? You had the back door and benches set this way. One for people to rest as they walked in the door. Their coat rack was right there. We had people sitting on that bench. And the church was full. And the choir was full because there was no room for anybody to go. And, and had a revival. It was back in... Uh, 79, 80, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? I remember the pastor said after the revival, the church had a problem. Someone stood up in a member, and the members been complaining and said, I don't know what we're going to do. We can't afford material for all these new people. It always happens. You know, things are going good. You say that, and then, you, and of course, well, never mind. But anyway, Satan tries to hinder the work. If he can, he tries to destroy the work. Evidently, Ephraim felt snubbed. What was their motive? Well, maybe they were proud. Maybe they were arrogant. Maybe they felt they should have been consulted. Uh, maybe they were missing out on some glory, they thought. But they were hypocritical because when Gideon sounded the alarm to come help, they didn't show up. But they showed up. When the victory was being won and they said, why didn't you get us? We would have been glad to help. Well, you wasn't there at the beginning. But what's impressive is how Gideon handles it. He says, what have I done in comparison to you? In other words, he praises them. He says, he recognized that they, they had a part. And he says, you know, what have I done? I'm paraphrasing this. All I did was blow a, a horn and hold a torch and we sit there and the men, you know, you went out and got after him. And so Gideon eats a little crow. And, he, and instead of just rebuking them for their glory seeking or whatever, he, he dis, diffuses it and he becomes a peacemaker. That's a good lesson for all of us to learn. What do you think? Matter of fact, Gideon said, uh, is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim Better than the grape harvest of Abizar. In other words, in other words, isn't the the leftovers of your tribe's grapes even better than our harvest? What he's saying is, you you folks are so much farther ahead than we are. What have I done compared to what you've done? So so Gideon takes the high road by humbling himself and realizing, saying, Hey, I didn't do a thing, but you're the one who did all the work. So he praises them, and then I'm saying they say, I can't say anymore. It's called defusing the bomb. It's called disarming the situation. Preacher, I hate your sermon. I do too. 
I did a lousy job. Wish I could go back. What, you got any pointers for me? You see what Gideon, he became a peacemaker. You say, why that? Because Gideon had bigger fish to fry. Gideon saw the big picture. It's not about the tribes and who gets the glory. It's not even about uh, how many of the enemies dead. It's about fulfilling God's redemptive purpose. And God wants to preserve the whole nation of Israel because it was through the nation of Israel the Messiah would come. And if they would become destroyed or if they would become so corrupt, God would have to destroy them. Guess what? It messed with God's redemptive plan. And that's the battle of the ages from the beginning of time. So Gideon was all about the big picture. So sometimes in a church, you've got to disarm the bomb. You've got to eat some crow. You've got to think of the big picture. I don't want to win this, bat win this, this battle. Uh, I want to win the war. You with me? The hill to die on. What, what hill are you going to die on? Not every hill is the one you ought to die on. You ought to, you ought to choose carefully which hill you choose to die on. Because, you know, I, don't want, to, I want to make it count. I, I want to fulfill the purpose. And Gideon was about fulfilling God's purpose, not just getting his point across. I know times people argue about Bible, what this means, what that means. And, you know, some things you need to stand for. Other things you need to just say, okay, you, you're free to disagree. It's best because we can't agree on everything. Am I not right about that? Yeah. But we've got something going on in our country right now where nobody wants to be a peacemaker. It's all or none. You know, you got to believe like I believe and say what I say or I'm going to cancel you. Okay. And that's exactly the wrong view. So God is still at work. The good is he's using an imperfect man to be a peacemaker. Something else, Gideon has pain and poverty, but God is still using him. Look in verse 4. He's exhausted yet pursuing the enemy. No one said it was going to be easier. easy. Sometimes you get exhausted, exhausted serving God. And so he comes to uh, Succoth, which is a village of his own people. And he says, give us some food to eat. And the people of the village said, I don't see the kings you're pursuing. You haven't got them yet. So we're not going to give you anything. Because they were thinking here, if we help him out, and we don't think Gideon has a chance, they're going to come back and kill all of us because we helped him out. So his own people wouldn't help him out in the God's cause because they didn't believe God's cause was going to win. His own people turned on the, the town of Succoth. It's called tra being a traitor. It's called not, it's, it's caused not getting on board with what's right. I'm not trying to pick on the deacons. We've got great deacons, but years ago I was in a business meeting and uh, the deacons was going to propose something. Okay. And, uh, okay, we're all for this, yeah. And so I had the business meeting and uh, proposed it and uh, presented it and, and said that the deacons, all the deacons agree, let's show, show your hands. And guess what? Only one or two raised their hands. The rest of them did this. Didn't want to take a stand. Didn't want to do right. It's called leaving you out there to hang. How many of you felt that way, huh? Huh? And that's what happened. <laughs> but my point is, you know, God's people need to stand with God's cause. What do you all think? They need to be loyal to one another on issues of right. They need to realize whose side they're really on. The gospel and truth? Or you're on the side of, of wrong. And, and uh, I know of one church several years ago. And I'm chasing a little rabbit. Don't worry, I, I kill it. So I get back here. Uh, church one time ago, this pastor was counseling this couple about getting married. And uh, this lady was uh, uh, a prominent member of the church. Her parents were deacon. Her dad was deacon, all this. And, and uh, the, she was marrying an unsaved guy. And the pastor said, you know, I can't do this wedding because it's a violation of Scripture. You all agree with that? Did the Bible not say that? Yeah. Well, that's okay. We just want to use the church to bring our own preacher in. And he said, no, you can't do that either because you're doing something in the church that's unscriptural. Lost people and saved people are not to be unequally yoked together. That's what the Bible says. Like it or leave it, that's what the Bible says. Okay? Well, we'll see about that. And so the influential family uh, got people together. And all of a sudden... 
within a few months, Pastor so-and-so was gone. Okay. But the problem is, a lot of people in that church knew what the Bible said and they knew what happened, and so they were gone too. And it took the church years to recover. Why? Because God's people did not take God's side, even though it would be against their opinion or their family's liking. You follow what I'm saying? Well, sometimes we've got to take God's side against us. I always take God's side against me a lot. Well, do you all do that too, huh? The other times I sin, okay? It's one of the two, okay? And we take God's side if it's against our friends, our families. No matter who it is, we want to take God's side. People that suck off didn't want to take God's side. Get out of here. We don't want, we don't want you to bring your problems here. Well, so he goes down to Finel, another town, and guess what? They say the same thing. And, and as, as, as Gideon leads, leaves, he pronounces judgment. Again, he's doing God's will. He's pronouncing judgment. He says to the people of Succoth, I will flail your flesh with thorns and the wilderness with briars. And remember, Gideon is the leader of Israel. He's a magistrate. He has the authority to execute. He has the authority to do judgment for traitors. And he goes down to uh, Penal and he says, I will tear your tower down. You know, every city, uh, uh, Paris has the Eiffel Tower. You see that tower, you think of Paris. You see the Washington Monument, you think of what? Washington. You see the arch, you think of St. Louis. Okay. And so you, you, this town had a tower that everybody knew it stood for the town. Okay. And he says, I'm going to tear your tower down. You know, in other words, I'm going to destroy your importance. They acted cowardly, they acted traitorously, they acted selfishly. But Gideon didn't do it right then. Why? Because he was about doing God's purpose first. Amen. This is part of God's purpose, but he had to get back to it later. Because his job right now was to take care of the Midianites. So he had his priority, but through patience. He had problems, but he was patient. You know, some things we have to take care of today, but the other things can wait till later. Let's do the first things first. Reminds me of the plane that crashed in the Everglades. You said, what did it crash? Well, there's a light going on, a faulty light that said the landing gear was, was, uh, wasn't coming down. And was it a, a faulty light or was it maybe a, uh, a real happening? You know, you want to make sure the landing gear's down when you land. So they, they were circling over the landing, uh, Everglades and looking the manuals, trying to find out if this was a faulty warning. But they forgot the main thing of the main thing. While they were doing that, the plane kept descending and descending. It crashed into the Everglades and killed hundreds of people several, several years ago. Why did they crash? It wasn't the light. It was they forgot the main thing, fly the plane. Gideon had to do the main thing, finish up on the many nights. We'd take care of this other problem later. You know, the church needs to keep the main thing the main thing. What do you think? You know, we can have all kinds of stuff, but the main thing is God's commission for us is to get the gospel, right? Amen. Share the gospel. Now, we have a building. We want to keep the building up. But why do we want to keep the building up? You ever ask that question? So you have a place to meet. What for? Share the gospel. The building's a what? A tool. Like a hammer. Like a screwdriver. Like a car. What's a car for? It's to get you to work. Right? It's a tool. And so we need to realize the main thing is the main thing. So God works through patience and Gideon learned patience. Then he per perseveres in his assignment. He, he goes down in verse 11 and he attacks the army for they felt secure. They went out the way of the caravans, the Midianite army, and they felt they were, ooh, we're finally out of Israel. Gideon had crossed the Jordan and hunted them down. And he attacked them and surprised them and he pursued them. And he captured the two kings, Zeba and Zalmanah. And he defeated the remaining 15,000. Now, 300 against 15,000, I'd say is a pretty good, the odds favor the 15,000. Las Vegas wouldn't have liked that too well, would they? Because 300 men, exhausted, defeated 15,000 men. There must have been someone else fighting for him. What do you all think? An unseen force. God is who it was. See, Gideon was not satisfied with partial victory. He fulfilled his duty he did first things first, and God is teaching us the good of his redemptive plan is we need to fulfill what we're to do, make first things first. When that was done, now Gideon's got some mop-up to do. He's got to take care of the doers of evil, those who were traitors, those who, were, who did wrong. So he comes back to Succoth and Peniel, and he, he grabs a, 
a young man and he gets from this young man in verse 14 77 names of the 77 elders of Succoth and he goes back and guess what he does? He executes them. Talks about the briars and the thistles. That's a a phrase in the Old Testament, a way of executing. I don't, people don't really understand what happened there, but they were executed. You say, oh, preacher, that, that's so mean. That's so mean. You mean traitors that cause people to lose their life, having them pay with their life is so mean? You know, a lot of people talk about capital punishment. I'm going to tell you something. God ordained capital punishment in the Old Testament. Do you know that? What did he do that for? Because people are sinners, by nature and choice. And God has to control that. If not, civilization would be run over and God would have to destroy the whole civilization. Our magistrates are rulers for good. They keep evil in check. Here's an example. How many of y'all believe the Bible? The Bible says we're sinners, right? That's why I lock my door at night. I saw a sign at the place one time. In God we trust all others pay cash. They know the nature of man. Okay. Why do you have capital punishment? Because God ordained it. Not that you have the right to kill your neighbor, but uh, the government does to execute people uh, for crimes. And, you know, we've we, you know, we, we, we got a snowflake mentality. I don't think you see Gideon having a snowflake mentality here. You know. In other words, he saw it, what it was. He saw the seriousness of what their sin was. In other words, because of their milk toast, lack of commitment, they put God's work in danger. Because, I'm going to say a freebie here, because of the people of our land's lack of enforcing justice. You know, the problem with our border is just the fact that we don't enforce the laws we have. The problem with our riots in our cities and people get in, let out, and all the crime we have is we don't enforce the laws we have. That's the problem. Because we're all victims. We're all victims. But God is a just God. The soul that sinneth shall die, the Bible says. He's also a merciful God. Amen? Amen. So there's a balance there. You say, I'm, I just don't believe in this. Well, I know it might go against what you raised, but you know, you go in the Old Testament... The Bible is an R-rated book. It's full of blood, guts, beheadings, crucifixions. It's, 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 it's full of annihilation of people. You say, is that sinful? God ordered it in many cases. Because God is God. And we're so far lower. than We need to start thinking like God thinks. If we think like God thinks, we would be truthful, loving, just, and forgiving. There'd be a balance. And see what you're not getting at about he comes back and he tears down the tower of, of, of Hino, uh, the men every day that were hiding in it, okay? What you're, what, you're, what you're not getting about this is that all this was a gracious act of Gideon. You say, why? The day that they said, we're not going to feed you, he, he could have destroyed them all right then for refusal to be on this side for treason. But no, he said, I'm going to come back. That was an act of grace, yes. giving him time to repent. Mm -hmm. I know somebody else has said, you know, I'm going to destroy you. I'll be back one of these days. You need to repent. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't his name Jesus? When he comes again, didn't he say he's coming back? Yeah, he's going to, and, and out of his mouth is going to come a sword, the Bible says. Going to slay in Armageddon. You ever read Revelation? Jesus said, you need to repent because I'm coming back. And for the past 2,000 years, man has had plenty of time to repent. So don't go and say, well, that's just terrible. No, uh, that's far more than we deserve. The men of Succoth and Bino got far more, far more than they deserved. Wouldn't defend their own people? Concern about just preserving their own life? You go out and die for us, but we're not, you know, we're just going to be whatever they want us to be. But God wanted them to be something because He has a redemptive plan in mind. Oh, they weren't interested in God's redemptive plan. They weren't interested in dying for God's cause. 
They were only concerned about their own living and living that day for their own cause. And so Gideon shows up at Succoth and he, he says, Behold, he has the two kings with him he captured. Can you imagine their jaw dropped? Before they said, you don't, I don't see the kings with you. We're not going to give you anything. Now he comes back to the kings with him. And now he executes the leaders of the city. The Bible says he taught them a lesson. That's a, that's a cruel lesson, isn't it? But that is, you know, God's just, folks. You need to realize God is just. Then, the, then the, we go to the kings that he captured. And he asked him about what happened to the, to the men uh, uh, whom you killed at Tabor. See, evidently they had killed Gideon's brother and others at Tabor. And he asked the kings, and you know what Gideon says? If you would have spared him, I wouldn't kill you. But they had killed Gideon's family. They had killed other people. So therefore, Gideon tells his son to kill him. Now, this is a judicial thing. Gideon's a leader, military, okay. But his son was young, and you know, why did he tell his son to kill him? It's because... It would be a dishonor for a king to be killed by a young man. See, if, if you as a king, the, the more higher up person that, that executed you, the more esteem you have. Okay? So Gideon wanted to take away all their esteem, and he wanted his son to kill him. But his son was too schemish. You read the Bible, it's there. So Gideon rises up and he kills him. Oh, God calls him a mighty man of valor. Wow. You mean God sanctioned this? Yes. Because it's about God's glory. It's about His redemptive plan. It's not about what we think and we don't think. You know, we have sissified masculinity. Instead of, instead of giving our boys Barbie dolls, Bobby, Barbie dolls, and taking away their cap guns, why don't we just have them read the Bible a little bit? You know? And I don't, I think the young men of Israel were pretty tough fellows. What do y'all think? They were men. They were not to fight for any cause, but they were to learn to fight for a right cause. Why? Because you're in a den of lions, a, a world of sinful people. Uh, uh, those who are the stronger will take and abuse and Who's going to raise up a standard against that? We've sissified manhood. All the hog worships on TV and all this, you know, and all the philosophies out there. All it does is preparing a bunch of people to be enslaved by some form of government such as communism and the Nazis where you're powerless, they control you, Oh, that never happened. Sure, it won't ever happen. It's still happening everywhere in the world except here today. You think I'm wrong? I'd like to talk to you about that. But Gideon, we find, we find that Gideon, uh, his righteous punishment, he executes the king. Even warfare was bad that day. You know, back then, you know, uh, I don't know if I'd like a sword stuck in me. What do you all think, huh? Would you like a sword stuck in you or a spear? You know, they couldn't say, medic, give me morphine. I didn't have any of that either. Things were pretty brutal back then. What do you think? But men were brutal. Men are sinners. Men are just as much sinners today. But you know, God has a redemptive plan. And first things first. And we find that Gideon, he also gives God the glory because they say, Gideon, why don't you be our king? And he says, I won't rule over you. My son won't rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Oh, this is the same guy that killed the other kings with a sword. You follow me? This is the same guy that, that had the 70 elders executed. He's saying, I'm not going to rule over you. I'm not, you know, this is, this is about the Lord. Let the Lord rule over you. Let God execute you. Let God lead you. In other words, you're accountable to God. Yes. Wow. Gideon was a man. But, you know, if we look at Gideon, we realize that God, the good God is doing uh, uh, through peacemaking. Gideon was a peacemaker. Uh, Gideon had pain and poverty. Gideon proclaimed the judgment, and he was the, the judgment of God. He was patient. 
But he persevered in doing what he was supposed to do. And he punished the doers of evil under his authority. By the way, you as a parent need to take care of those under your authority. You have kids. It's your responsibility to execute justice and love. That means you don't let the inmates run the prison at home. That means you clearly define the rules and to break the rules. This all time out stuff. You know, my, you know, the Bible, if you want to know what the biblical answer is, the rod of correction, it's uh, in uh, Proverbs. Isn't that what the, how many of y'all believe the Bible? Huh? You know, you know, my dad didn't have a rod, but my mom did. It's called a hickory switch. The biggest trouble I ever got was she always said, go cut a switch for your sister, not cut down a rose bush. I learned a lesson. I was trying to get her good, you know. My dad had a belt. He didn't beat me. The fear was greater than the pain of the belt. But I learned respect. I learned, I learned, you know, you don't break the law or something bad happens to you. That's what a bunch of kids need to learn today. We raised a, a bunch of spoiled brats who have no respect for law enforcement or anybody else. And it's the parents. Maybe there's too much time out there. And they think, well, I go time out, go to prison for a little bit. They feed me and watch TV and all that and get out, you know, a little time out. You know, why do you spank somebody? Oh, family service would not like me saying this. You spank them to associate pain with disobedience. That's why you do it. And the rear is a good place to associate pain. It doesn't harm the body. Okay. That's why God, never mind. But anyway. The problem is, if you say, you grow up realizing when you disobey, there's pain associated. That might keep you out of prison. But you know what? That might keep you out of hell. But you know, my message won't be accepted in our society today. People say, you're wacky, preacher. You're way out there. No, I'm just being biblical. You watch too much TV, read too many books. Follow God's way of doing stuff. I'm not saying beat your kids. I'm saying... Discipline them in love. Yeah. Associate pain. Now, time out is good when they get older, I'm sure. You know, I remember when I, I started laughing at my parents when they spanked me. It was too late to spank then. You know what I'm saying? It didn't hurt anymore. But, boy, when they take the keys, that hurts. Can't drive. Cut off TV. Of course, the one channel we had today, you cut off the computer. That really hurts, right? But there's a way of associating. But, anyway, let's get on. And I, I'll be through here in just a few minutes. We find, though, that... Gideon was offered the job of being, of being the king. No, I, his job was temporary. I'm just the judge. Let God rule over you. Amen. He did it in the Lord's name. Yes. And so my point is, is we look how God accomplished the good purpose of his will through the past events of imperfect people. God used Gideon, an imperfect man, as imperfect as it was to do great things. Something else, in a bad, a fallen world, the bad is that God won't or God's people won't always do right. How many of y'all know God's people don't always do right? Noah got drunk. David committed adultery. Gideon has his sin. Samson has his. God's people don't always do, do right. So what we do is we look how God accomplished his will, his good will, but we also learn from the bad choices of those who've gone before us and don't make their mistakes. That's why the Bible's given to us. We look at the Old Testament, all the wrong decisions made in the Old Testament. What happened to God's people for making wrong decisions? That's for us to learn so we don't repeat it. I think our country needs to learn that right now. You say, what did Gideon do? He said, what you can do, you can give me your gold. So they give him 43 pounds of gold. And what does he do? He makes an ephod out of it. What's an ephod? That's the priest. The breast of the high priest, it was a thing that it was full of gold and different colors. It represents the high priest. The high priest, you were, you're like a Supreme Court judge. You were one for life. If you, were, if you were a priest, you were one for life. And high priest was a lifelong term. What's Gideon trying to do? He's trying to usurp, be something God did not ordain him to be. He wanted to take over the priesthood. You know, he didn't want to be king, but he wanted the respect of a king and live like a king. So he made him an ephod, and, and now I'm a spiritual 
director, but the problem is God did not choose him to be that. And many times we try to be what we're not supposed to be. We try to get out of our lane. How many's ever got out of your lane? You know, you know, you're not the boss; they're the boss. You know, God, God, you know, uh, Gideon wasn't to, wasn't to be the priest, and he had a poor understanding of the scripture. So he thought, "Oh, no problem." But the problem is, it became a snare to Gideon and the people. They started worshiping the ephod as an idol. Be kind of like having a statue of Mary here. Oh, we won't go there, will we? Okay, never mind. We kind of like we're worshiping a, a, a relic. It was idolatry because the people were idolatrous at heart. And so he just gave them something to worship. It was a snare to him and his household and to the nation. It helped lead him back into idolatry because he, he took something that wasn't his area of authority. Kind of like our politicians during the pandemic, they started doing things that wasn't within their constitution authority. Like telling churches you can't meet. Or you have to do this or that. By the way, our constitution is a separation between church and state. Or a separation of laws concerning religion. And that means a separation to them. And so the church is not under the state. The church is a separate entity. You all know that? Here in, here in the United States. Now, that's not everywhere. It's viewed that way, but here it is. But, but you know, it's different. But so, so, you know, there's a, can the government tell you what to preach? No. Can it tell you what to do? No. But we should be responsible and do what's right. What do you all think, huh? Yeah. But there are some churches that have been shut down. Some, I saw a, a church in Canada had a six-foot fence put all the way around it by the Health and Human Service or whatever it was in Canada because the people were seen hugging in a parking lot. Now, that's carrying it a little bit too far. Had all the uh, troopers out there, what they did, they kept people, they just put a big six-foot fence around the, or eight-foot around the church. I, I mean, you all see that? That church in Canada? And that, that way the people couldn't attend their church because they were violating the COVID restrictions. Okay. You know, so, you know man is a sinner, and sometimes a man has a tendency to go beyond his authority, whether it's at work, whether it's in the church, whether it's Gideon. Gideon did that too, by the way. That was not sanctioned by God and caused problems. So what do we do? We look, point number two, we look at the bad effects there, the choices, and we purpose not to repeat them. How many of y'all had a parent that did stuff wrong? What do you do about that? You still love your parent. God bless them. But you learn their mistakes and you don't repeat them. And I sure hope people learn of my mistakes and don't repeat mine. And the rich man in hell looked up and said, Send someone to my brother's house that they might end up here. And he was hoping his brother would learn from his mistakes and not repeat and go to hell with him. So we find Gideon had an inconsistent testimony. And he led the people into false worship at the end. He had many wives. Oh, uh, where's the Bible? I thought polygamy was not exactly, it happened in the Bible, but it wasn't exactly God's plan. You all agree with that? You know, he had all these wives. And one of the sons from his concubine, after he dies, kills all his other sons to gain power. Wow. Consequences of not fully following upon the family. And we find what happened at the, at the very end here. Gideon dies a good old age. But yet his family and the nation were left going downhill in the wreck. So Gideon was a good man. God worked through him, but yet Gideon made bad choices. We need to learn from those. That's the bad. What's the ugly? Here's the ugly. Look, look at verse 33. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal birth their God. And the people of Israel didn't remember the Lord, their God, who had delivered them from the hand of the enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubal, that's Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. Israel had an ungodly character, ungrateful heart, unloving actions. That's the ugliness. It's the ugliness of rejecting the grace of God. We need to loathe that. Why should we hate when we see that? Because if you reject the grace of God, there's no other hope for you. Even as a Christian, if you're not uh, rejecting the grace of God living the Christian life, you're going to be defeated. You're going to fall. We need to hate rejecting the grace of God. We need to loathe that. We need to learn from the bad choices those who've gone before us have made and, 
and not make those mistakes. And we need to look around and see, well, God is still at work in this mess we're in. He's still accomplishing his redemptive purpose through imperfect people, but God's still on the throne. That's the good, that's the bad, and that's the ugly in Gideon's time. And that's the good, that's the bad, that's the ugly in our time. As bad as it is, God still is work. It's still at work. The bad is, yeah, we, we don't always do what's right. But let's learn from our mistakes. And the ugly is there's people rejecting God's grace, and that's the thing you can't do. You shouldn't do. It's so ugly because it's snubbing your nose at God, and there's no hope when you do that. You end up in sin if you're a believer. If you're a believer, you end up in, if you're not a believer, you end up in hell as the end result of that. So let's purpose to engage with God's good plan, not make the mistakes of those who've done bad, and try to persuade people to turn from their ugliness of rejecting a loving God's grace toward them. Let's pray. Father, I pray you take this message as, as uh, many viewpoints in this passage, Lord, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Help us to realize that you're good, and you're doing good, you're working good in the midst of this mess. Help us to purpose not to make the mistakes of the past and realize the bad is we don't always live up to it, but there's forgiveness in Jesus. And help us to glorify your grace, that people realize that your grace is the only hope of salvation and victory through sin. Help us to respond to this invitation in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name.